Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. After the fall into sin, a number of new things happened in the world. Thorns and thistles and weeds made farming more difficult, and work which was once enjoyable became laborious so that Adam would provide for his family by the sweat of his brow. And speaking of family, for Eve the Lord multiplied pain in childbearing. Certainly that would have been something very strange and frightening for Eve when she first went into labor, as I'm sure it is for all mothers when they go into labor for the first time. But Eve had no advanced warning from her elders who went before her, no wisdom about it, nothing. All of a sudden, she would have known pain like she hadn't before when her hour had come. Yet after that, what joy would she have felt to have given birth to the first babe, holding in her arms the first infant, the first child. She rejoices, saying nothing of the pain before, but only the joy afterwards, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, after having washed the feet of his disciples and having instituted his sacrament, begins to say his last farewells to his disciples before he goes to the cross, telling them that he is going somewhere where they cannot go, somewhere where they cannot follow, at least not yet. It is in this context that our Lord tells his disciples, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. In this context, he warns them of what will come while also encouraging them as well. It is in this context which he makes the comparison that while the disciples, that what the disciples will go through is like the experience of a woman giving birth who experiences great pains but then great joys from the same event. The disciples were confused about all of this, about what he was saying, wondering about both the little while and the not seeing and the seeing again. Thus our Lord explains, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will, leap, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, for joy has come into the world for a for joy that a human being has come into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. These words stand out in the midst of all of this. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. With these words, Jesus contrasts the disciples to the world on the day of his crucifixion. There will be a stark difference between the disciples and the world on that day, where some are filled with grief and great loss and others exuberant joy. The disciples will weep and lament. They will sob loudly with uncontrollable weeping as they see their beloved, their Lord and Master, bruised and bloody, sweating from the exertion it takes to stay alive after being brutally treated before his crucifixion. They will wail, crying aloud with great wailings and moanings which can only come from deep within from a person that hears of the news of their dear and loved one's death. They will lament for the dead one, who although he was righteous and innocent, died the death of the worst and most cursed criminals. But while they are weeping and lamenting, the world rejoices with evil glee at seeing the one who so vexed them die. The world was filled with great joy as its evil schemes came to pass. The world, along with death and the devil, said on that day, Let us lie in wait for this Christ, because he's inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. He became a reproof for our thoughts. The very, light, the very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike others. 
and his ways are strange. We are counted as him as something base, and he avoids our ways as unclean. He calls the last end of the righteous blessed, and boasts that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true, and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. Let us test him with insult and torture. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. Sometimes when we see the disciples different, dip, having difficulty believing, or we see their fear, we think, I would certainly have been different. But would we? Would we have not also rejoiced at his death if we were there? Would not we have also been vexed by him for calling us to repentance like so many others were? Surely we would have, for our own sin put him there. Our own sin put him to death, insulted him, tortured him, and condemned him, though innocent, to a shameful death. But we were not there, we are here. We were not onlookers and mockers, but were Christians enlightened by the Holy Spirit who has created faith in Christ Jesus. And so because of what we do know, even though we are 2,000 years removed, it was our sin that put him there. And so it was our hands that abused him by our sinful actions. And we are right to mourn and weep and wail and lament our sin which caused this, as we rightly sing on Good Friday, who struck the blow that killed our gracious master. It was I, thy conscience cries, I have wrought disaster. Yet our Lord also says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When I see you again, you, your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Just as the same event for the woman giving birth brings both pain and joy, so too with the disciples. The same event, the crucifixion of their Lord Jesus Christ, brings both pain and great joy. For their Lord, their master, their teacher and friend who was once dead, was now alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. They knew he was dead. There was no mistaking it. But now he was alive. He went to the cross for them. And although they scattered when their shepherd was struck, he had come again to them, alive. Not as a ghost or spirit, but in body, fully alive. He comes to them then, having utterly defeated death, so that it could not hold him in its jaws. No longer could death keep him, and so he lives forevermore. The world, death, and the devil rejoiced, thinking that they had won, that they had conquered their holy foe. But they were led astray, their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God. Rather, they were vanquished conquered by Christ Jesus through his death. That is why, even though this event brought sorrow to the disciples, now it brings joy, joy that cannot be taken from them. This world cannot harm them, death cannot alarm them, and the devil cannot take them from Christ's hand. What joy to see their Lord again, for he was dead, but now he lives. So he would encourage them for 40 days after his resurrection until he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We too, like the disciples, are strengthened and encouraged and given great joy in this, because while it was our sin that took him to the cross, he went willingly, and he took our sins upon himself and brought them with him to his cross so that by his death he would take our sins away from us forever, so that by his death he would atone for sins so that when they had laid him in the grave, our sins also went to the grave. But he is risen, and our sins are atoned for. In holy baptism, we are baptized into Christ's death, so that his death becomes our death. Our sins are thus left in his grave, while we rise again with him. So faith clings to Christ and receives the promise that he has made, specifically that his death has destroyed sin and its power over us, and we are forgiven for his sake. Since we have died with him, and do not, we do not need to fear death. Death has no dominion over Christ, and since we are in Christ, and we have died with him, death has no dominion over us. Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. 
Death is no longer a raging foe, but a defeated enemy. The world still thinks that Christ was defeated, but it is deceived by its own wickedness. The world is still gleeful and joyful and will attempt to take away our joy, thinking that it's won by throwing everything that it can at us. Satan likewise will throw our sins in our faces, attempting to rob us of joy. But Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Our hearts rejoice, and no one can take that joy from you. The world can take everything from us, but it can never take Christ. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we too shall arise and be welcomed into his kingdom, which has no end. Satan can throw our sins in our faces, but Christ has taken those sins to his cross, and there he bled and died for them. He forgives us our sins by his grace. This is not received by any work that we do, that Satan may cause us to doubt it, but it is received by faith, by trust in him, no matter how faint. Because Christ has done this, we have confidence in him, for he has overcome the world and defeated the devil. Death can kill us, but we merely go to be with Christ our Savior. Thus the grave, once seen and still seen by many as a cold and ever-closed tomb, becomes for us a soft bed for our mortal remains to wait till the day of resurrection. But we do not see Christ as the disciples did. He does not appear in our midst in the same way that he appeared for his disciples. He does not speak to us in the same way that he spoke to his disciples. Yet we still have joy, joy that cannot be taken away from us, because we are encouraged by the disciples' testimony of these things. Those who were his disciples preached the resurrection to many and in public spaces, in the temple and in synagogues. It would have been simple for the enemies of the disciples to produce the body of Jesus if it was still in the grave. After all, there were guards who would be put to death if they let anyone steal it. It was sealed with a seal, but they could not do it because Jesus had robes. And while we cannot see him with our eyes like the disciples did after the resurrection, we do see him by faith. For he is present in his word, in his word which is powerful, and not merely simple words spoken or found on a page, but words which he gives power to create and sustain a living faith which trusts in his promises. With eyes of faith, we see him in one another, in, who, in we who have faith in Christ Jesus. For by faith we are united to him and he dwells in us. We, as his Christians, are his body on earth, and he is our head. We see him in one another and so treat one another with love and respect, both because we have all been redeemed by him and because we belong to him, but also because he himself has united himself to us. As he said, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did to the least of one of these, my brothers, by brothers, he is saying those who have faith in him and are made sons and daughters of God, you did to me. So too, faith perceives him in the bread and wine of the sacrament. We cannot with our five senses see, smell, taste, hear, or touch him, but by faith we believe that he is present with his true body and true blood according to his promise. And truly, he is present. Faith then receives the benefits which he gives with his body and blood in the supper, which he won by his death and resurrection, namely forgiveness, life, and salvation. One day, the last day, when he returns, we will see him as he is. On that day, we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we will be like him, and our lowly bodies will become like his glorious body. That day, the dead will be raised, and all who are alive will be changed in an instant, putting off the corrupted mortal flesh and putting on pure immortal flesh. That day, the world will know it has deceived itself, its evil glee will become eternal gloom. But for we who by his grace believe, who trust in Christ Jesus for our salvation, who believe he died for us and rose again for our justification, our joy shall evermore increase as we live in his presence forever. 
Then we shall see him with our eyes, and he shall see us, and our joy shall be full and eternal, never to be taken away. God grant this to us all. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>